So you just picked up your first Total War game, loaded into your first campaign, and you are clueless. You don't know what you're supposed to be doing. Well, I'm going to tell you what you're supposed to be doing and go over some of the basics of campaigns and important things to be aware of. Campaigns can honestly be as simple or as complicated as you like. It depends how in-depth and how effective you want to be at the campaigns, but you can get by just ignoring things sometimes. Anyway, let's go from the top. So, turn number one. What are our goals? First of all, we can look at our long campaign objectives. What are we ultimately supposed to be doing? How do we win? This is where the objectives come into play, whether you want to take the Homeric victory, which basically means you need to take out Troy in Odysseus's case, which is something we're definitely going to have to build up to and will take us a while. Or you can go for the Total War victory, where you basically just take everyone out, control loads of territory and be the king. Again, another objective that takes a long, 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 long time to achieve. Whichever one you go for, it's going to take a while, so we don't really need to worry about these. Troy is all the way over here on the map for Odysseus, so it's a long old trek to get there, let alone to be powerful enough to be able to take them on. So we don't need to worry about these two objectives for now. What are we supposed to be doing then? It's all about the two E's, economy and expansion. Economy being increasing your resources up the top here, food, wood, stone, bronze and gold. We want more and more of these so we can build bigger cities and better armies. The bottom number is what your income is per turn, and the top number is how much you have stored up. Food is probably the main resource as it funds our armies, but they're all important for various purposes. So goal number one is improving our economy by increasing our resources. And goal number two is expanding our territory. Currently I have a couple of settlements on this small island, but why not have this whole area here? I can expand and take all this if I want to. Or it can have kind of an indirect expansion by making friends and allies with those who do control it. So how do we improve our economy? First we need to understand how a province works. We have a capital city like Ithaca here and then I have three kind of production settlements. The only one I have at the moment is same which as you can see by this icon here is a farm settlement. It gives me food. This settlement gives me stone if I were to take it and this other one down here gives bronze. So I can get different resources by taking different kinds of settlements. If I want a certain kind of resource, I just need to find a settlement that will increase it. So at the moment I can get lots of food, but not a lot else. So I'm going to need to expand. But the other way to increase these resources is to simply upgrade the buildings. The more you upgrade them, the better they get. You do need to watch out for negative traits though. Like on this building, you can see on the far left, it gives minus 70 growth, which will slow down the growth of my province. Or this one, minus one happiness. If I build this when my happiness is struggling in the region, it might be a bad idea because it'll make things a little bit harder for me. So I might want to avoid that one. We can also build the military buildings, which will allow you to unlock new kinds of troops. You'll also want to get these so you can get stronger units in your army. Although of course these will have more upkeep cost and make the armies more expensive. So if I'm looking at a certain settlement, I can decide if I want to increase the output of the resource that it produces or build something unrelated to the resource. In this case, I'm going to make a military building so I can get some javelins. But in the long run, this may not be the best place to put this building because I can't upgrade it fully to its highest level because these small settlements only go up to tier 3. To build this marksman's range, I need it to be tier 4, so it would have to go in the capital. This is fine though, I can destroy it later and replace it with something else. For now, I just want to get some javelin units in my army nice and early. So overall, the main way of gathering resources is to construct buildings and upgrade them. Of course, the more you upgrade the building, the more income it will grant you. Honestly, you don't need to think too much about it, just upgrade buildings when you can if you can afford it. Like I said, you can play this very simple or very complicated. If you want to pay attention to all the little stuff it says on the left there and how it will affect your economy, go for it. If you want to ignore it though, that's fine too. As long as it's upgrading, you know it's a good thing. Only if it has a negative trait, you might need to pay a bit more attention to it. Other ways to get resources might include the royal decrees or Victory missions, awards. or you can change your army stance to raiding, which will take resources from whoever's lands you happen to be stood in. So make sure you don't do it in your own lands or you'll be robbing yourself. So you can go into an enemy's territory and raid them to steal some stuff off them basically. You can do this in non-enemy's territory but of course they're not going to take too kindly to it and it will affect their diplomacy with you meaning they might go to war with you basically. For our royal decrees these are perks that you get for every set amount of turns that pass. These will improve various things and are based around the five resources. Again do you want to play simple or complex? If you want to go complex look at what everything does and decide which is best for you at the time. If you want to play simple, just pick any old one and it'll be fine. You'll be improving over time no matter what. So these are some of the main things for improving your economy. 
And just to go over it as well, let's have a look at Divine Will, your favor with the various gods. These are fairly self-explanatory, simply scroll over the god to see what they do for you if you have favor with them, and then level them up through respected, celebrated, worshipped, and you'll get the appropriate rewards. Some of them may fit a certain playstyle better, or may just be situational when you're trying to do a certain thing, like trying to defend your homeland or push on the enemy. You can also pray to a certain god at any time to gain a short boon. Again, these are situational. This one gives us siege holdout time, useful if we're being besieged. This one reduces the enemy morale, useful if we're about to go into a big battle. Think about situations where someone would pray for something in real life, in situations of need, that's what we're using these for here. This one with Poseidon, immune to deep seas attrition, so if we end up in some deep seas and we really don't want to take the attrition, we can pray to Poseidon and hopefully he'll be able to get rid of it. So use the prayers when you need them for the situations. And then we've got Hecatomb, which will just improve the favor with a certain god. So if you want to bump yourself up into the next tier for a god in a certain situation, again, situational, might be useful to try and bump yourself into Celebrate it to gain those boons, which could be useful at the particular time you jump in there. Because, of course, these god favors are decaying all the time, as you can see at the top, minus 10 per turn. Now, once again, I'll say it though, you can play simple or complicated. You can kind of ignore this stuff and you won't get the benefits, which will make life a little bit harder for yourself. But if you don't want the stress of it and worrying about it, you can kind of ignore it. One of the best ways to get favor though is to build an altar of some kind. You get all the different ones for all the different gods. They give various different boosts. So build whichever one you like the look of, whichever god you wish to favor. There is some stuff in there which can help your economy as well. So it is all useful to follow and not that complicated. If you're going into tough situations, those are going to be the times that you'll probably want to call on the gods. You may also have some faction unique mechanics that you may want to look into. These are also different. I can't really tell you exactly how to use them all, but just read them and I'm sure you can figure it out. Now, the next important thing to worry about with our kingdom is the happiness. This is something we can't ignore because if it gets too low, we're going to get rebels and they are going to make life difficult for us. You can see the little face on the tooltip above any settlement. It'll tell you all about how much happiness the settlement has, what's affecting it, what's making it go down, what's making it go up, blah, blah, blah. The main source of getting happiness is building the appropriate building that will improve happiness and then upgrading it so it increases happiness more. Other ways to improve happiness can be taking an entire province and then issuing a commandment for it. You can get a priestess, I think, and just leave her around in the territory and she'll increase happiness. You can garrison an army in one of the settlements and that'll increase happiness. There's some royal decrees that do it. You can get favor with the gods that do it. There's many different ways to increase happiness, but we just need to make sure it goes up as high as we can. If it drops to minus 100, you'll get rebellion and you'll have to sort out the army that spawns. Otherwise, they may wreak some havoc. And then we have growth. This is how quickly you can upgrade buildings and settlements. This number, when it hits the threshold, will grant you one population surplus. When you've got enough population surplus, you'll be able to upgrade certain settlements. So here you can see my capital. If I want to upgrade it to a citadel, I need two population surplus points. At the moment, I've got zero, so I need to wait for my growth to keep going up, generating me those population surplus points, and then I can use them to upgrade the settlements. You can increase growth through various means, just like happiness, but it is one of those things that's always going up, so you can ignore it if you want to. If you do pay attention to it and do try to grow things faster though, you'll be able to upgrade your settlements quicker, meaning ultimately more income. So it can pay to focus on that, potentially. And then we have different cultural influences. You can think of these like religions, trying to convert more and more people to their side. Your faction will have a preferred influence, and if a different influence starts to take over, that can create problems. Sometimes with happiness, it can reduce your output of your building, so there's many reasons to try and keep the influence high. This will be affected if you have neighboring factions nearby, they may be affecting the influence, so you might need to counteract them somehow with buildings or with agents stood around, or by just taking those bastards out. Something that usually doesn't require too much attention, but you do need to keep an eye on it, because if it goes too far the wrong way, you might find some trouble. Okay, so that's most of the crap on the economy. Now let's talk about expansion. First of all though, when you start any new Total War campaign, they've usually kind of preset you up a little battle and a settlement to take. In Odysseus's case, there's this little army here, which is just ours for the taking. So we're going to go ahead and attack them on our very first turn as one of the first things we do. First of all though, we can use our spy to maybe help our situation out. We can poison their well to give their army some losses or kill one of their heroes, making life a lot easier when we come into that battle. We can also act against settlements as well, again making it easier for our armies when we attack. So we're going to go ahead and attack this army, poison the well, see what we can do. 
Success. So we're going to have hurt some of his units, making life a lot easier for my army. You can that see there, these units have taken some damage now. So this fight is going to be way easier Favorite for Odysseus. This is a fairly easy battle to win anyway, but now it's even easier. You can see the auto-resolve bar is very much in our favour, the balance of power. So we can just auto-resolve this and not take too many casualties. Sometimes if that bar is lower though, you will take potentially more casualties if you opt to auto-resolve than if you just fight the battle yourself. So sometimes you can be better off fighting these early battles. At the end, you'll have an option on what you want to do, up take to you. They're all kind of useful, slave. depends what you like. Have a look and read them, not hard to figure out. So we've taken out that first army. That's our kind of pre-setup army. We've completed a mission and got a new one issued here as well. Now we can push on with our next turn. As I said, they've normally set you up a settlement or two to take. In this case, this settlement is mine for the taking. This is just kind of a preset way that Total War campaigns usually go. This is what is supposed to happen. Don't go back and sit in your other settlements. Push on and take this one because it kind of supposed to. It's set up that way to be nice and easy for you to give you a good little start. So we go through the next turn and here we are. We recruited a few more units. So our army is a little bit bigger now, making it a bit easier to take the settlement. Again, going to use my agent here, Murmurs of Sedition, going to potentially assault the garrison. We've succeeded again, nice. So every settlement will have a garrison army. You can see it if you click on the settlement and then there's a little button at the bottom. It shows you what they've got if you're near enough to see it. Or there is just a little icon above the settlement to show you how big their garrison is as well. But we're going to go ahead and attack this. Again, nice auto resolve, got some good damage on those units from the agent. And we'll be able to take this settlement, no problem. Now, once we've won this battle, we'll have a choice on what to do, though. We don't have to just take the settlement straight up. We've got some options. You can just occupy, which is the safest bet. You will control the settlement. It'll be yours. Won't be too much problem with happiness and things like that. All good. You can loot and occupy, which will give you some resources. But of course, the people won't like it so much. So you might have to work a little bit harder to stabilize that happiness. I'd say loot and occupy if you think you can safely control the population without them getting out of hand and getting overrun by rebels. Sacking settlements will get you lots of resources, but you won't take the settlement. You'll just kind of ransack it and then run away, leaving it. You can take it again afterwards, though, if you want to. So you have some options with that, or you can take it on the next turn. Or you can raise the settlement, which will get you some resources, make everybody very unhappy because you'll burn the place to the ground. This is the one you want to use if you're trying to hurt the enemy faction. You don't want to take this territory because it might be really hard to hold. So you don't want the problems of worrying about it yourself, but you want to weaken the enemy. So you'll go ahead and raise it. But in this case, we're going to occupy because this is part of our province and we want it. So we've expanded now. We've got three settlements of the four. You can see this province has four settlements altogether. We've got Ithaca. We've got Kranui or however the hell you say that. And we've got Same, but we don't have Hyri yet. So this is the one we need to take to complete the province. A province is just a group of settlements in the same region. So Hyri is the last one I need here. So my next course of action is going to be to come and take this. This is what I want so I can complete the province. And when I do, I'll be able to get this thing down in the bottom left, a commandment, which will give me some improvements to the region overall. Generally, when you're looking to expand, you want to take one province at a time where possible. So one of your first orders of business is to try and take your starting province. Now, once you've got your first province, you're going to want more of them. This is where diplomacy really comes into play. And you have to be a little bit careful because sometimes you might make more enemies than you want. The little icon down the right side will tell you everything you need to know about your relationship with another faction, whether it's good or bad and what's affecting it. Now, one of the important things to look out for when choosing someone to declare war on is making sure if they have friends or not. If I declare war on Sparta here, they have allies, the Mycenae and the Troizen. If I declare war on Sparta, I'm probably going to be declaring war on these two as well. That is way more than I want to fight. I'm biting off far more than I can chew. So Sparta, definitely not a faction I want to try and declare war on right now. Especially as they're very friendly with me as well. So I want to find someone who's not so friendly with me. One of these two maybe. The Koreats here. And I'm already at war with the Teleboans, so obviously they don't like me. So maybe these Koreats could be the ones I should go for. Let's have a look. If we look on the right, you can see who their friends are and who their enemies are. They're currently at war with one enemy. That's cool. But they have no friends, no military alliances, no military allies, no packs of any kind. So this could be a good faction to declare war on because I'm only declaring war on them. Nobody else is going to get pissed off about it. If I declare war on this faction, see, they've got some friendly stuff with Sparta there. So I might piss off Sparta if I attack these boys or if they have trade agreements that might annoy them. So we need to be careful of who we're affecting. You can see this faction here has no friends or allies, so that could be another good one to attack. 
So always check out the diplomacy before you go declaring war on someone or even performing any hostile action against somebody. If you piss off the wrong people, you may not make them declare war on you right away, but you'll make them start to dislike you and that may keep going and then they'll declare war on you as well and you'll end up in more wars than you'd like. So always keep an eye on the diplomacy to see who you're truly affecting. Sometimes it's not always possible to avoid declaring war on someone with an ally, but you just have to weigh up the power of that ally and whether it's worth taking them on. Whether you can take on both of those factions, or maybe you could call one of your allies to help out against them as well. There's different ways to do it, but you just need to be careful not to get yourself into too many wars. Now a little more on diplomacy, we've looked at how we can get into wars and what we need to be aware of. Now what about making friends? Let's say we want to make friends with Thea here. Well it all starts with these five buttons on the left. Non-aggression pact, military access, defensive alliance, military alliance, eventually to confederation potentially. Now if you want to make friendly with any faction you need to start with a non-aggression pact to make them trust you. You can't just jump to any kind of military alliance. One you may want to get before or after the non-aggression pact is a military access though. If you want to walk through somebody's land, make sure you get military access permission. If you walk into somebody else's land who isn't an ally of yours, they will get pissed off about it unless you ask for military access. Defensive alliance, this is basically you swearing to protect each other if one of you gets attacked, but honestly, you don't actually have to go over there and help them if they get attacked. If they're in a bad way, you may want to to try and help keep them alive, but otherwise, you don't really need to do anything with this to maintain it. The military alliance, same thing, it just gives you a few more options, allows you to give them a war target so you can tell them where you'd like them to attack, maybe they'll do it, but do realise that you will be dragged into all of their wars and them into all of yours. Confederation is basically absorbing them into your faction, you will control them and everything about them, they will become you. This only really happens though when you're very powerful, way more powerful than them, and they would like to become your bitch, basically. Then we have barter agreements. This is where you trade resources. You can trade any kind of resource you want and you'll see the success chance here. Or you can do a barter agreement, which is where you trade for a certain amount of turns. It's the exact same thing. You can just change the amount of turns that it happens for. So let's say I want to give him three wood in exchange for two stone for 10 turns. Cool, he's happy with that. We could do that if we want to. This is of course good for gaining resources that we don't have a lot of and spending things that we have an abundance of and also building positive relationships. Then you have all the different break buttons, break military access, break agreement, whatever. These are best used if you want to declare war on somebody, but you don't want to piss off the friends. So you can get the friends to not really be involved with them anymore, and then they won't be affected. So you can just declare war on the one faction. This, of course, though, will cost you. And then we can join war with pretty much anybody. We could offer to join their war again to build a relationship. We can help them out, or we can just kind of be mercenaries and try to get some income from it, from something. Or we can try and gain the territory ourselves, by declaring war on another faction. So there's many different reasons you might want to do this. I'm going to try and declare war here. I'm going to do it. Oh, I asked for 100 gold, but he only has 25. So I'll do it for 25. I'll join his war. Now I'm a freaking mercenary. So that's most of the diplomacy options. It's all about either making friends or making enemies and controlling those relationships. Obviously, that's what diplomacy is, right? But you can play however you want. Just destroy everybody and have no friends or be a total diplomat and make all the friends. And lastly, on the topic of expansion, the armies themselves. You can build them up Odysseus to take the enemy God. territory. You can build the armies of all kinds of different things, but that's a whole nother story for another day. I do have a battle guide if you want a little bit of help with that. But the main thing to look at here is how much the army is costing. The army upkeep in food and anything else. In this case, a bit of bronze as well. If our army upkeep starts to outweigh our income of food, then we'll go into negative food, which isn't necessarily a terrible thing. Sometimes it's okay a little bit for a little while, if it's necessary. Recruiting units themselves is simply a case of paying a fee for the unit and then paying an Naturally. upkeep cost for every turn that you have them. You can disband the unit if you're not using them, which is often a wise idea if you need to save some money or food. But alas, all of our enemies have armies as well, obviously. So we need to manage that as well as just building armies and charging them around. We need to be aware of the enemy armies and what they're doing, where they are, where they're going, where they might go, and when they're leaving their cities vulnerable. You need to pay as much attention to the enemy armies and where they are as you do your own. Because there's nothing worse than having a massive enemy army suddenly arrive on your coastline. So Total War is very much a game of attack and defend. You're not doing either of one, you're doing a bit of both pretty much all of the time. Now this big army has rolled up on me here, 15 units in this army. This is going to cause me some problems if I don't do anything about it. Now I do have my army here that can wait for them on the shore and attack them. I could fall back into my settlement and just wait for them there, or better yet, I could try to ambush them with this stance here. 
This will potentially get me an ambush battle, which is very advantageous for me. It puts me surrounding the enemy and hurts their morale, so it can be a good idea to try and set up an ambush for incoming enemy armies. It often works very well. It works a little bit better if you can hide in trees somewhere on the map, but it can still work fine. If they try to attack my settlement, they'll probably run into my army, get ambushed hopefully, and then I'll be able to take them out. If I ignore them and just go straight after their settlement, they'll probably go and take my settlement. So you can sometimes trade with people, but it depends if it's worth it to you. In this case, it's not because I've got a nice little collection of buildings here and he could potentially take all three of them pretty quick. So I need to do something about this army. I could build another army, of course, but it depends if you've got the money for it. In this case, I don't have a ton of food left after recruiting another general. So this might not be such a good idea. I will go into minus food, but I have a little bit of food to survive a few turns if he does come at me. So this could be an option. Like I say, it doesn't matter if you get minus food for a few turns and you lose maybe 500 food or so. It's not a big deal. As long as you don't go below zero and stay there, otherwise you'll start taking attrition and your armies will start dying. But as long as you manage things okay, that will never happen. So I could build up that second army, take a few turns, lose a bit of food and still push on with my big army to try and take the final settlement of this province. But of course, there's the risk that he might go back and try to defend his settlement before I get there. And then we'll just be playing a weird game of cat and mouse and it'll just be a bit awkward. So in this situation, I'll probably try and wipe this army out by staying in ambush in my lands, letting him come to me. Hopefully he'll walk into the ambush. I can take his army out and then I'll be able to come down to this settlement while it's undefended. He might be building another army up, but I should be able to get to him before he gets a big army and I'll be able to take them out. So be aware of attacking and defending and where your enemy armies are. Using agents is a good way to scout well ahead and to see what enemy armies are up to and whether they may be coming for you or whether they've left somewhere undefended. They also come with their own perks and abilities depending on what you do with them. Like the spy here, as we saw earlier, he was poisoning people to reduce the garrisons and the armies. I've got a priestess over here. She can be handy just standing around in a province. She increases the happiness, which is useful if you're struggling with happiness in a province, right? We've got the envoy. He can be useful for various things, one of which reducing the upkeep of one of your armies, making them cheaper overall. Very useful. So look at all the things that spies can do and figure out how to use them effectively. One more thing to be aware of is your hero and all the skills that they have and all the things that they can bring to the campaign. Again though, simple or complex, how do you want to play it? Because some of this stuff can really be ignored. Same with the skills, they can be useful for upgrading your general, they can make your troops better, they can make you better, but ultimately you can still play the game the same and not really pay too much attention to it, other than picking things that might be a little bit useful to you. None of them are huge game changers, so don't worry too much if you don't understand all the stats and what everything means. You can also get equipment for the same end of increasing stats and buffs. So I think that's about it for the campaigns. I think you've got the gist of it by now. Let me show you what further down the campaign might look like for Odysseus. This is turn 60 in my Odysseus campaign that I've been streaming. You can see I got this first province a while ago. I've been upgrading it a plenty. I pushed out over here, took a couple of settlements here. I wanted to take the whole thing. Altus isn't too much use to me because I need coastal regions really as Odysseus. Got this province as well though. Just expanding a bit more, acquiring more land, just more resources to get. You can see my entire ownership here. I'm all the white stuff. Got all of this. So you can see I've just been expanding, right? One of the two things you need to be doing. Increasing your economy or expanding your territory. And as for my economy, as you can see, I've got a lot of food right now. Got a nice bit of income on all this stuff. Need a little more gold, but we're okay there. So yeah, increasing my income slowly and increasing my territory as well. So it's really up to you how much territory you want to take, what territory you want to take, who do you want to declare war on, who do you want to make friends with, who do you want to make enemies with. I've decided to take this little bit of territory and then I've pushed all the way out here because I wanted to try and take some of these islands. As I'm Odysseus, I like coastal Odysseus settlements, so these islands are perfect for me. And as I gather a few more, I'll hopefully get a nice foothold to eventually start to move on Troy or to maybe take some of the land near Troy and just build myself up to complete that final objective. I've also been making friends with some of my nearby factions, Sparta to my southeast. There's a little faction here I'd like to get rid of eventually, but for now we're okay with them. The Arcadians we're pretty friendly with, so I'm hoping that the Arcadians, myself and Sparta, can take all of this lower region eventually and just control that and work together to get towards Hector. Maybe going north a bit, taking some of that territory, we'll see how it goes. But that's just my campaign and what it might look like as you advance through your campaign. You can play it however you like though, such as the freedom of total war. So there you go, a guide to Total War Troy campaigns. I hope this was useful to you. If there's anything I've missed that you'd like to know, drop it in the comments and I'll do my best to answer. Thanks for watching. I hope you've enjoyed this. Do check out these other videos if you need a little bit more help. 
I'll see you in the future.